Now, you barely know it by looking, but the usual suspects recently turned a whopping 25 years old. A quarter century on this ingenious mystery thriller remains one of the most deftly crafted films of its type, spinning an intentionally convoluted neo-noir plot into one of the most spectacular, jaw-dropping payoffs the genre has ever seen. However, The Usual Suspects is, on the whole, a film densely packed with details that probably passed you by. Needless to say, there's a lot to talk about, so let's get on with it as I'm Jules, this is Culture.com, and these are 20 things you've somehow missed in The Usual Suspects. Number 20. The Title's Classic Origins Though the movie's title has existed as a general saying long before The Usual Suspects ever hit cinemas, its origins are not so coincidentally cinematic as well. The phrase was brought to the public attention and popularised by the 1942 classic Casablanca, where in the film's climax, the captain quips round up The Usual Suspects. But writer Christopher McQuarrie only indirectly lifted it from Casablanca, as he settled on the title after reading an issue of satirical magazine Spy with a column bearing the very same name. It's inspired by the movie. Even so, if you're going to borrow, you might as well borrow from the best, whether intentionally or not, right? Number 19. Kint looks at Kuyan's coffee mug. Now, there are many, many hints throughout the film to its big twist, that the identity of Kaiser Soze is in fact verbal Kint, and we get a subtle early nod towards Kint's ingenious deception when he's brought in for interrogation, and both himself and Agent Kuyan are served coffee. Once Kuyan asks Kint to tell him what happened after the lineup, Singer focuses on Kint as he stares at the base of Kuyan's coffee mug, foreshadowing that he will use elements from the interrogation room, including the Kobayashi-branded mug, to spin his convoluted tail. Number 18. The cast literally couldn't understand Benicio del Toro. Now, Benicio del Toro is an easy show stealer as Fred Fenster, who is surely best remembered for his thick, scarcely understandable accent. And though this simply seems to be part of the character as written, it was actually something del Toro himself came up with during shooting, to the extent that the cast literally couldn't understand him. And so, when the suspects are held in jail together, and Hockney asks the group what Fenster just said, that was the actual actor expressing genuine befuddlement at del Toro's pronunciation. Number 17. Kaiser Soze's Very Thick Urine Though audiences likely wouldn't think anything of it upon first viewing, when Kaiser Soze urinates on the ship moments before it becomes a smouldering wreck, his urine is briefly focused upon, where it's decidedly, um, less fluid than actual human pee should be. This ties in directly to a quote from Kint at the start of his interrogation, when he asks for a coffee and says, I'm really thirsty, I used to dehydrate as a kid, one time I got so bad my piss came out like snot, I'm not kidding, it was all thick and gooey. And there you have it. Number 16. Brian Singer's Voice Cameo Director Brian Singer has a sneaky off-camera voice cameo in the film during the iconic interrogation sequence, where Fenster reads the phrase, Hand me the keys, you cocksucker. The voice of a cop can then be heard over the intercom requesting, In English, please, which in addition to being the voice of Singer, was reportedly ad-libbed by the director while shooting the scene, per Del Toro's incomprehensible performance as Fenster. It certainly added a welcome layer of humour to the scene, and no doubt contributed to it being one of the film's most memorable sequences. Number 15. Redfoot's Accidental Cigarette Flick Midway through the movie, the central characters get into a confrontation with Redfoot, the LA fence who sets up a meeting between them and Kobayashi. This culminates in Redfoot flicking his cigarette in the face of McManus, which viewers may have assumed was a feat of movie trickery, but alas, it was anything but. In reality, Peter Green was supposed to flick the cigarette at Stephen Baldwin's chest, but it landed in his face instead, resulting in a genuinely startled reaction from Baldwin. You'll notice that singer cuts away from the cigarette flick extremely quickly, which is reportedly due to the cast and crew stopping to check on Baldwin before resuming shooting. Number 14. Kint quotes Baudelaire Surely the movie's most memorable quote sees Kint tell Kuyan the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he didn't exist. It's the sort of genius line that every screenwriter wishes that they could have come up with, but in fact, Christopher McQuarrie paraphrased the quote from legendary philosopher Charles Baudelaire. Baudelaire's 1864 short story The Generous Gambler includes included the delicious line, The devil's deepest wile is to persuade us that he does not exist. Macquarie, evidently a bit of a reader, repurposed the quote and in turn gave Kevin Spacey one of the most iconic lines of movie dialogue ever spoken. 
Number 13, The Foreshadowed Death Order After the team meets up with Kobayashi, they're given a briefcase full of envelopes detailing the upcoming ship mission that they're tasked with undertaking for Kaiser Soze. In an amusing detail, the envelopes are actually doled out by Keaton in the precise order that the doomed members of the team are killed – Fenster, Hockney, McManus, and then Keaton himself. That's quite the impressive troll on the part of Kint, and yet one which most viewers totally missed. Number 12, McManus's Bruce Lee Homage after Kobayashi's bodyguards are shot dead in an elevator, we briefly see McManus wearing a disguise whilst sat atop the elevator. And while it might seem like any regular maintenance-style disguise, it's actually a direct homage to the classic 1972 Bruce Lee movie, Fist of Fury. In that film, protagonist Chen disguises himself as a nerdy telephone repairman, coke bottle glasses and all, in order to gain access to the home of a man who facilitated the death of his teacher. Clearly, somebody involved with the production, most likely singer or Macquarie, is quite the martial arts fan. Number 11. Kent literally confesses to killing Keaton Though there are numerous subtle hints to Kent's crime lord alter ego, there is a moment in the movie's climax which sees Kent literally give the game away entirely. While being aggressively interrogated by Kuyan, he shouts at him, trying to tell me you saw someone kill Keaton, to which Kent replies, I did, I did. However, if you listen very carefully, you can also hear Kent say, I did kill Keaton, but due to Kuyan shouting over the latter half of his sentence, neither Kuyan nor the audience actually know notice it. Better still, the subtitles don't include Kint's confession either, so unless you're watching the movie with headphones or on a high-end sound system, you're certain to miss it. Number 10. Hockney's Guilt At the start of Kint's interrogation, Kuyan mentions to him the first thing that he learned on the job was how to spot a guilty man, that whoever actually manages to sleep after being put in jail committed the crime, because they've actually let their guard down and allowed themselves to rest. This actually turned out to be true about 10 minutes earlier, when we saw Hockney as the only person laying down and having a rest after the men were arrested. Of course, we later learned that Hockney was in fact responsible for the gun truck hijacking, which landed them in jail in the first place. So you know, Kuyan wasn't wrong. Number 9. Soze means verbal a major hint towards Kaiser Soze's true identity is hiding in plain sight throughout the movie, given that the word Soze is derived from the Turkish idiom Soze Bogmak, which translates to to talk unnecessarily too much and cause confusion. Verbal, basically. Given that the film itself mentions numerous times that Kaiser Soze is Turkish, any Turkish viewers may well have figured out the big twist long before anyone else. Number 8. Kint's Possessions Another hint lying in plain sight now. At the end of the movie, after Verbal is being released after posting bail, his possessions are then given back to him, including a gold watch, a gold cigarette lighter, and a pack of cigarettes. Well, for anyone paying close attention to the start of the movie, you'll notice that Kaiser Soze can be seen sporting all three of these items on his person. Even discounting the cigarette, there aren't too many people that would have both a gold watch and a gold lighter. Busted, right? Number 7. Christopher McQuarrie's Cameo While few viewers could be blamed for not recognising Christopher McQuarrie's cameo in the movie at the time of its release, in the 25 years since, McQuarrie has become a Hollywood household name, largely thanks to his recent involvement in the Mission Impossible franchise. And so, you might be startled on a rewatch to see McQuarrie hanging out in a number of scenes, most prominently appearing at the very end of the film where Kuyan frantically exits the police station in search of Kaiser Soze. McQuarrie plays the police officer who can be seen talking to two men, and he's practically looking right at the camera lens as if to address the viewer themselves. Number 6. Nobody Behind the Ropes during one of the final flashbacks to the boat massacre, we see Verbal hiding from an assassin who shoots Keaton and sets fire to the dock, with Verbal apparently looking on through a pile of ropes. Except, Brian Singer shot this sequence in a specific way to cast visual doubt on Kent's account, because as Verbal approaches the pile of ropes, we simply see him disappear behind a stack of tyres. Singer then pulls tight in on the ropes, and despite Kent apparently watching the massacre through the obvious holes in the pile, Kent's face cannot be seen at all. This was because Singer actually told Kevin Spacey to stop moving when he got to the tyres, ensuring that, quite literally, nobody was crouched behind the ropes. Because, of course, Kent's story was absolute bullshit. Number 5. Giancarlo Esposito is in it Now, if you haven't revisited the usual suspects in the last decade or so, you'd be forgiven for forgetting that the fantastic Giancarlo Esposito appears in the film as a slick FBI agent known as Jack. Though Esposito certainly wasn't a no-name actor by 1995, he generally worked in a character actor capacity until 2009, where he played the career-defining role of Breaking Bad villain Gus Fring. And so, going back to this film today, seeing a decidedly younger Esposito in a role you'd never expect to see him in makes for quite the surprise indeed, and a pleasant one to be sure. 
Number 4. Kint's Knowing Smile Midway through the film, Kuyan tells Kint that he thinks he's lying to cover for the real mastermind, Keaton, at which point Singer trains the camera on a close-up of Kint as he begins to smirk. Now, while on first viewing it simply seems like Kint is being amused by Kuyan's assessment, once we know who Kint really is, it's clear that he's smirking at something altogether more calculated. Given that Kint makes sure to stifle his smirk before Kuyan moves around to look him in the eye, there's no way this wasn't intentional on Singer's part. Number 3. The Subliminal Reveal during the film's final montage of Revelation, we're shown yet another perspective of Keaton being shot dead, except this time there's the faintest, most subliminal flash of the man known as Kaiser Soze himself. For just two frames, Kint is visible as Soze whilst shooting Keaton, seemingly confirming the twist that's about to be dropped in the stunned viewer's lap. It's so fleeting as to be easily missed by most, but those paying close attention have got a very small chance to learn the big reveal a few seconds ahead of everyone else. Number 2. The Origin of Soze's Hat and Jacket now, Kaiser Soze is of course remembered for his distinctive attire, kitted out in a long black trench coat and hat, but this fitting ensemble is actually something that he picked up on the job. You see, earlier on, for a single shot, the clothes are visible hanging up in a room of a person that Soze murders before taking care of Keaton. Clearly, Soze appropriated the duds, given that he wouldn't be needing them anymore. Basically, if you thought that Kint just carried a trench coat with him wherever he went out on manoeuvres, this was actually a feat of slick improvisation on his part. And number one, Kint's smoking style. And finally, as Kint rides off into the unknown with Kobayashi at the end of the movie, you might notice that he holds his cigarette in a slightly peculiar way, grasping it between his index finger and his thumb. As you probably know, the overwhelming majority of smokers hold their cigarettes between the index and middle fingers. But Kint's peculiar approach is actually incredibly common in certain regions of Turkey. With Soze being Turkish and all, that's a pretty neat detail, albeit one that could definitely give him away if he forgets himself. And there we go, my friends. Those were 20 things you somehow missed in The Usual Suspects. I hope that you enjoyed that, and please let me know what you thought about it down in the comments section below. As always, I've been Jules. You can go follow me over on Twitter at RetroJ, but the O is a zero. Or you can swing by Instagram, where it's the same handle, RetroJ, but the O is a zero. And you know how I like to end my videos here. I am the usual suspect of positivity, after all. So I just want to make sure that you treat yourself well with love and respect, my friend, because you deserve all the best things in life, all right? Like love, happiness, and success. Don't let anything or anyone else tell you otherwise you yes you listening to this video are a massive ledge and i just want the best for you all right now go out there and smash it as always i've been jules you have been awesome never forget that and i'll speak to you soon bye